now resuming the recording. Recording has started. Very good. Well, good afternoon to North American folks. Good evening to European folks. I don't see anybody to whom I have to say good morning to, but... Yes, you do. Oh, well, there you go. You wild, wild and woolly waking up at ungodly hours people. Um, good morning, Brian. Uh, and so a final reminder, please go to the Cody MD page. Uh, you should see the link both in the Jabber room and in the WebEx chat. Please do go to codymd.ietf.org, the main page for that site and sign yourself in through the data tracker because that will be helpful. And add your name to the, to the blue sheet in our page, if you would. And we are recording this session. And let's get started with the agenda bash. Um, and just a reminder, this is an IETF meeting. We are operating under IETF note well rules. If you do not know the note well, please go to the IETF site, find that and read it over. But everybody here looks relatively experienced with the IETF process. Either way, you are responsible to follow the IETF processes. Our agenda is relatively straightforward. We're going to do just a little five minute intro. We are then going to have uh, three short, they're really impressively short presentations. Thank you for the three who are doing them. Um, going on the assumption that everybody has read the documents, but might need little highlights of changes or reminders of what's in them. Uh, and then we are going to jump into discussion of direction. Any additional agenda items or things that we have to deal with? Anybody want to pipe up? Anybody want to unmute who might be muted who doesn't know that they are? Good. And please do mute when you are not speaking. That is helpful to everybody. Um, so here's our little reminders. Um, the purpose of this session is to dispatch this topic area and or these documents, which is to say, the discussion on content in any of the documents should be kept along the lines of where we're going to have this discussion in the future and what form it will take. We don't need to be going into the details and solving the problems of these documents in this session. We're dispatching. And the dispatch choices, which you know from the charter, can be anything from we don't want to work on this topic and we toss it out the door and we uh, express that to Alyssa or we want Alyssa to take it on as an AD sponsored document or we want to set up a working group or a buff or hand it to some other organization. But one of the things that is specifically not chartered for Gen Dispatch is we do not work on documents as a working group. We dispatch them. That's it. Unlike some other dispatch working groups. Um, so we want to know what would be a satisfactory output, whether a BCP informational document updates to the RFC style guide, changes to the NITS tool, general review guidelines, a manual of style, whatever that might be. Uh, those are okay things to come to a conclusion that this is what we think the way forward should be. The chairs have gone through the minutes and the Jabber logs and the mailing list. And we sent out a summary beforehand. You can see it if you want to scroll down in your code at Cody MD. Um, we've got assorted summaries. And Brian uh, came up with a short summary in one of his email messages, which we thought was helpful. So we added that onto the bottom. And um, please do feel free to read those over. And in Ministrivia, we would, um, beyond the blue sheet stuff, if you are logged into Code EMD, right now, um, Francesca is going to be doing our note taking and I'll try and run the queue. If, um, if you would care to please do add to her notes, that would be helpful. If you can 
just type something or keep an eye on what she's typing and say, oh, I can clarify that a bit. That is helpful to us. We're not asking anyone to be the note taker. That will be Francesca, but your help is appreciated. Any questions about any of that? Oh, and if you do want to raise your hand, uh, plus Q in the chat window would probably be the most useful way to do that. And let me make sure I have a chat window open so that I can see people. Whoa, Ooh, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to get a chat window open. But in the meanwhile, um, have someone in the queue, Elliot. Go right ahead. Good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening. I'll turn on my video. Um, I just have a question for the chairs about these documents and how and what our options are. Um, if if we're not able, if we don't have the ability to discuss any of the content, then I mean, isn't our option really only to to dispatch to a working group or a boss or something? No, 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 no. Now, it, I mean, it, first of all, let me qualify the. Um, we can discuss the content insofar as it is helpful to determine what the dispatch is, right? So if you say, look, um, this document says such and so, I think that would make a good basis for a BOF or a working group or whatever it might be. That's a perfectly reasonable comment. Um, this document says such and so, I don't think we should concentrate on that area whatsoever. So our dispatch claim should be do this work, but not that work. Those are all perfectly reasonable things to comment on. Um, what we don't want to do is okay. say, write the document, whatever okay. that document turns out to be. Just wanted to say thanks for the clarification. Clearly, I, I should have had an, an additional dose of caffeine before getting on the call because, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Good. And Alisa? Can you clarify the relationship between this meeting and the one next week? And like follow up yes. on the list, like when when was the actual decision supposed to take place? So what I'm hoping is from this meeting, we're going to get a set of minutes um, where the chairs will put their heads together at the end and maybe consult with you and come out with a summary of where we're at from this discussion at the end of this meeting. And that will hopefully feed into a short list discussion on making sure we've gotten it right followed by the second meeting for any open issues to deal with, or because some people couldn't make this meeting and felt like they wanted to have some interactive time if they have new issues to bring up or want to reiterate anything from the first meeting, that's more than welcome. But um, it, it is an extension of this meeting. Um, it should not be necessary to participate in both. Uh, the discussion should be summarized reasonably to the list and the recordings will be available, but uh, at the end of the second meeting, the chairs will get together. Um, we'll bring our summary again to the list, talk to you about that, um, make sure that on the list we are convinced that we know what the consensus is as far as how to dispatch it, and then the call will be made as, you know, the Gen Dispatch dispatches it in this particular way. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Sure. All right. Um, with that, and trying to keep my zillions of pages straight here, I'm going to bring this window over and hopefully make this full screen. He says, there we go. Enter full screen. Is that sufficient for everybody? Uh, except that's Keith's and we were starting with Niels and Mallory's. So let me push on the right slide deck here. My apologies. Grr. 
Ah, thank you. So, um, is it, uh, I saw both Niels and Mallory are here. Which one of you would like to talk to these? Hey, Pete, I'm presenting. Great. Um, just yell next slide when you want next slide. Sure. You can go ahead to the next one already. Okay. Thanks. So I'll just review the basic info very quickly. Um, it's always helpful for us to state what our objective is and what our non-objectives are. We just want to increase the readability and readership of these RFCs and IDs. That's it. The non-objectives, we're not trying to change existing RFCs, existing language, and we're not trying to forbid any words. Um, so what the research and the cited, the cited works in the draft so far talk about in broad strokes are that RFCs need to be readable and understandable and useful. Um, inclusive language helps with this. Exclusionary language is counterproductive. Um, and then as far as what's already happened. So again, this draft to remind everybody was drafted for the first time in 2018. So it's not very recent. Um, and since it's cited by CodeSpell, which is um, a tooling that you can use uh, that treats these exclusionary words as typos and will suggest alternatives. Um, and then very helpfully, we've now got a repository of all the other communities that are adjacent to the IETF that are also doing the same thing. And their language and rationale around that as well is documented. So we can go to the next slide, please. Thanks. So the biggest change in version four over version three is that now there exists another repository, which is an IETF GitHub repository that Alyssa and others have populated um, called inclusive terminology and IETF documents. So because this exists, um, we wanted to point to that and make that the focus and this draft turning into really the rationale for the existence of that repo. So the I, and I'd be happy for Alyssa to chime in after I'm done presenting in one more slide, but that's meaning to track alternative terminology, suggestions that authors and reviewers might follow, um, guidance as to how to apply this to new and novel cases as well, and then the very useful referencing. So that's just keeping track of all the um, all the work that other people are doing. And and I wanted to note too because Andrew Campling brought this up earlier today and is email to the gen dispatch list. Um, this is essentially what Barbara Stark had suggested very helpfully. Um, and so I'm glad to see that there's support for something like this because it exists. Next slide. And then so lastly, this is not really changed since um, the last meeting 108. What we think needs to be happen, what, what we think needs to happen with this is I don't think it should be dispatch, dispatched anywhere else. I think this is where it belongs. We're hoping that the Generia AD will sponsor this draft and that eventually becomes a BCP um, again, so that it can essentially justify and document the existence of the living repo that is now in GitHub. And that's it. Okay. Um... Anybody, I, I would prefer to just go through all three since they're kind of quick. If anybody has specifics they would like to mention now before we go on to the other two, that's fine. Go ahead and plus Q me, but uh, beyond that, let's go on to the second document. Which is bronze. Maybe one, two, three. All right. And if All right. Thank you, Pete. Go ahead. And cool. Uh, yeah. Next slide, please. So I have I have slightly more slides to uh, remind myself. Uh, my goal coming into this, looking at, at the discussion that exploded during the last IETF, was to try and find and document the areas that we agree, um, because there were clearly clearly areas in which the IETF doesn't have consensus. I uh, wanted to specifically make sure that we're not trying to solve all the world's problems and, and take sides uh, because there clearly is a lot of political debate around this. It's particularly an explosive topic in the USA at the moment, um, though also in other parts of the world. And I wanted to go back. I'm fairly new to the IETF compared to a lot of people on this call, but I wanted to go back to the IETF's mission um, and base things on that. If you could go to the next slide, please. 
so I went and had a look at the mission um, and that key quote there, making the internet work better by producing high quality relevant tech technical documents, I think agrees pretty closely with what Mallory said in the previous slide. Um, specifically, we exist to improve the internet to serve all humans and produce high quality documents that serve all humans. That, that all makes perfect sense. So next, please. Um, but we don't want to solve all the world's problems. Um, ours is specifically influencing the way people design, use and manage the internet. Um, we want to work on focusing on, on the upsides, not the downsides, um, but we are pro-internet. We're proud of our work and we think we do good work. Next slide. Um, and specifically also, we, we want to have some constraints over who we bring in. We want people who are technically competent and who want to improve the internet. I took some examples of stuff that we don't want in the IATF uh, because it's good to define our boundaries so we know what we're working with. And I'm sure there are other things there. There was an example I came up with on the mailing list to do with the idea that we don't want people who say work is oppression the word network contains work, therefore we must not use the word network anymore as a as a edge example of where things get ridiculous. Uh, next, please. Um, likewise, we want people to behave professionally and somewhat conservatively in how we interact at the IATF. Um, we want people to behave professionally so that communication is clear. We want people to behave in a manner that allows everybody to interact, um, which means that you don't bring your entire culture, you adapt to the culture of the group and the working culture. So we, we want to find norms that do that, but welcome everybody who has contributions to make as much as possible. So there's a balancing act. Uh, next, please. And I, I don't know if I have collected all the things that consensus consists of or ways to get to consensus, but the three I could see were you persuade people to agree with your consensus, you fatigue them, you just keep pushing until everyone gives up and then you've got consensus because nobody's arguing anymore or fiat, you, you have a group who has power and they push consensus by saying, we believe this is true, um, we believe this is so important that it must be done. Um, and so we will say it is so regardless of disagreement. Um, specifically, the you're all racists, which comes through uh, to a lot of people in, in their reading of one of the drafts here. Um, even if it's true, it struggles to persuade people. Uh, so I wanted to build on people wanting their drafts to last a long time and be read by as many people rather than on, than on telling them they're wrong as a way to persuade people to change their behaviour. Um, and then the final slide is a discussion of dispatch. Um, I, I doubt I've got everything. I doubt I've done a good job. Um, this is not my area of, of primary expertise. Um, so I would love to have someone work with this, work on this with me or to help someone else's draft. I don't think mine necessarily needs to be what's dispatched. But that's all I've got. All right. Let me add Keith's. Unless someone wants to pipe up at the moment. I don't see anyone making a comment just now. Uh, yeah, for what it's worth, I haven't figured out how to enable chat. So um, anyway, I'm not sure that I need, I need to, but. Um, but you can see the, uh, uh, the slides and you're good to go. Yes, I can see the slides and, uh, and apparently you can hear me. So that's, I yes. think we're good to go. All right. We'll so ask people. We can ask people to come to the mic if they have comments because we're not sure that the presenters can see the chat. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. I can't type into it for what that's worth. But anyway. Oh, interesting. So uh, I was asked to do two slides, so I did two slides plus the title, and uh, so we can go to the next slide. Love it. 
<laughs> uh, so, you know, the first thing I think is that we, I think no one here really wants uh, to use unproductive language. If we, if we offend someone or distract someone, that is uh, going to get in the way of understanding our documents. Uh, and I certainly uh, admit that we have not always done this ideally in the past, and we can improve what we're doing. And I, I really believe that the community overall shares that sentiment. Uh, I don't think people want to make documents that bother people. Um, however, the changes to language can impair clarity and readability. And I actually don't believe that this is something that some sort of uniform substitution or suggested substitutions uh, can really address in those cases where the harm is done. Um, Again, I think next bullet, most of the suggestions made about words we shouldn't use, probably not controversial because if you look, when I look at the list on GitHub, most of these I go, yeah, 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 not a problem, no, no. And that's, that's my opinion, of course, not everyone's, but I think most of these words are not going to be a problem. However, a couple might be. Uh, and the reason they might be is because they are actually very useful in our technical discussions, there's not necessarily an easy replacement, particularly not if you talk to the subject matter experts. And there may not be compelling evidence of harm done by use of those words. Um, so I would expect some controversy in corner cases, not for most of the list, but in a, in a few of those instances. Next slide. So there's a lot of recommendations in the draft, and they are of varying quality. I won't say that I think uh, that I, I certainly don't think they're all equally good. I just wanted to have some talking points. Um, but I think the right place to maintain um, information about exclusionary language is probably with the RFC editor if they're willing to do it. Um, and the reason is because I think this lumps in with other considerations about document readability, and we don't want to be looking at those considerations in different places. We really want, when you're writing a document or editing a document, you want to be able to sort of compare and say, well, if I use these words, it might cause, it might impair the readability of the document, but at the same time, perhaps these words are valuable in helping to get the point across, whereas some substitutes might not be. So those are trade-offs I think should be make, made at the same place rather than in different places. Um, the second bit is that I, it seemed like a good idea to me if the, the internet draft tools we have, so every time you submit an internet draft, it could say, by the way, I noticed you've got these words here, and they might or might not be exclusionary, but we, you know, maybe you'd want to take a look at it. And it's not, it should be advisory only, but the idea is to, to tell authors and editors or as early as possible, really, you might have an issue here that you want to look at. And I feel like the sooner we get awareness of this stuff into an author's hands or in an author's head, the easier it will be to resolve whatever issue that is by the time it's anywhere close to publication. So I think early warning is a good thing. Um, I do think that we should mostly entrust the author, editor, or working group to make good decisions based on the information in the style guide, uh, which I, I would assume would sort of include or absorb oh, what's on the GitHub page now. Uh, because the people writing the documents are the subject matter experts. And when other people try to make changes on their behalf, they will screw it up. Um, and I also think that we shouldn't have any mandatory blocking rules. They, that no one should hold up a document over this kind of terminology issue unless there's IETF consensus to back it. And the last major point, and there's several other points in the document, but the last one I wanted to put on two slides, is we shouldn't assume that we're going to go back and revise existing RFCs because that's opening a huge Pandora's box in many of those cases. It's an immense amount of work, uh, so we need, we need good reasons to do that. And I, it, maybe there's a document or two that really needs to be revised, but I don't think we should assume that we're just going to go back and clean up large numbers of RFCs. We'll, we'll you know, fix that going forward when those things are revised or replaced or whatever, but not, not as a separate action. 
So those are my two slides. All right. And if I'm not, well, I'll leave the screen shared up here for the time being just in case people want me to bring the slides back up for their questions. So I've got a queue of folks, which I'm assuming are all to the general discussion. Were there any specifics for Keith that um, people had questions or something like that? Oh, uh, Michael, you had, did have a question for Keith. Uh, Keith. Uh, so would, when you say that we won't revise existing RFCs, do you believe that uh, things that uh, should be entered as a editorial errata. Uh, I hadn't considered that question, uh, but I think off the top of my head, I think that is perhaps an option. Another option that I considered was maybe maybe we want to revise terminology and say, moving forward, we're going to change these terms. And you could, you know, I don't see anything inherently wrong uh, with publishing, uh, you know, a two-page RFC that says that. What I don't want to do is open up the old RFC and all the potential ripple effects that that can have. You've got to update all the references. You've got to update the boilerplate. You've got uh, now you've got other documents that are being in the process of being revised, and the new RFC has to wait until those revisions are complete. Uh, it really can take a very long time and a lot of energy, and often there's really not a lot of energy to do that kind of work. So. If there's some other way, perhaps the errata process or perhaps a separate, you know, brief RFC, maybe that would be better. I just don't want to open up the whole RFC and revise it for this reason. All right, Bron, you also wanted to speak directly to Keith or ask a question. Yeah, uh, another thing that came up on this specific topic that I think is quite important is that changing terminology. A lot of people have commented on the list that it's easy just search replace master with primary and slave with secondary and you're done, um, which is fine in the documents itself. But these terms have also found their way into a lot of code, into a lot of other stuff that's built on top of this. And so what you'll wind up having is two terms traveling in parallel as mostly syn synonyms into the future for quite a way. Um, and there are plenty of examples where having multiple terms for the same thing causes confusion and failures in systems. So there will be some and who knows how much. And that's the problem with pretty much everything on this topic is that there are different opinions about how much weight and how much damage each thing does. Um, there will be cases where things go wrong because of this. And so we have to be quite cautious about the damage that we can do by having multiple terms for the same thing. And Andrew, you also had a question or comment for Keith. Yeah, it, it was just building on that. Uh, um, I was also going to say, as Bron just did, that the straight search and replace might be problematic um, with things changed out of context. Uh, but the, my question for Keith was, if you're quoting from an existing document, I think one of the drafts, I don't think it was yours, suggested you, that you amend the words used in a quote if the terminology is problematic, which I'm slightly uncomfortable with because then it's not really quoting from, from the document, but I'd be interested to know what your view was on that. Uh, you know, I think that I think you need a really good reason to change the existing terminology, even when quoting, because I think it's, it's much more likely to add to confusion than to um, now, now, maybe there is a document out there for which there's a really good reason. I don't know that. But uh, overall, I think that we expect old documents to use historic language. I mean, part of what we're doing, language changes over time, and we're part of what we're doing is simply adapting to that. Like, people have already started, you know, minimizing the use of uh, gender-specific personal pronouns. Um, and you know, that's fine. Like, we're just adapting to our time, but when we read an old document, we don't expect it to be expressed in modern language. Uh, so I don't, uh, I wouldn't make a broad recommendation about that. I think, again, these issues are better sorted out by people who are close to the subject. If, for instance, you, database people are going to be aware of what database people, what language they are using, not only within IETF and elsewhere. And I expect the language we use in IETF documents to adapt 
along with everyone else, rather than IETF putting a stake in the ground and saying, this is how we're going to talk about it, and we'll be stubborn about that, and some other organization says, this is how we're going to talk about it. I expect this, these to be moving targets, and the subject matter experts should do what they think is best, informed by uh, the RFC editor style and, and whatever input we have that says, hey, we're offended by this language, and here's why. It's like, oh, okay, we, we should take that into account. But I don't want to make, I'm really skeptical of making sort of rules that say you shall do things this way. I think that's going to cause us more problems to help us. So with the last, you know, uh, with uh, particularly Bronze and Andrew's comments, I do again want to remind people to think about, you know, questions, comments that will end us up with a dispatch decision, not necessarily fixing the document as we want to see it fixed. Um, so, uh, I don't see anybody else who wanted to question. No, quick question. How do you raise your hand again? Oh, um, uh, in the um, in the WebEx chat, if you would plus Q, although if you want to do it in the Jabber room, we'll, I, I've got both windows open. I'll notice that too. Um, well, can you consider this my plus Q? And, and uh, specific for Keith or just uh, to the general Q? Uh, just to the general queue, um, right. I'm trying well, to type on my phone. I'll put in the plus queue anyway. I will, uh, I, I will Nico plus queue you. I did it. I did it. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, running back to the top of my general queue, um, uh, Jim, you wanted to. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks. Um, I have a concern about the way that this discussion is kind of being uh, seen from the outside as being an official IETF position. Um, I've already run into a situation where uh, Mallory's draft was cited and referenced as an IETF document. And I'm also looking yeah, at the GitHub repository. You know, you look at github.com slash IETF slash terminology, and you get this, uh, this thing that really looks like it's an official IETF position. And I want to make sure that that uh, I, I'm concerned that you know we're 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 making decisions about this, and people are going to interpret what's there as IETF has decided. Yeah, I, I mean this is this is a constant problem, and uh, I I appreciate the reminder. And if folks can label stuff appropriately, the drafts are already labeled. You know, these are individual, not product of the IETF. But do keep reminding people when that is the case. Um, I appreciate the comment, Jim. Thanks. Uh, Victor, you're next on the list. Victor, Unmuting my mic. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, now we can. Okay. Um, so to the general topic of dispatch, um, I have a couple of points. Um, one, uh, you might note that I'm not speaking Elizabethan English, and yet nobody has banned iambic pentameter. Uh, we don't have to ban language that is uh, in the process of going away, it happens organically. So I'm far from convinced that any of these need to progress in order to see the IETF using language that's currently deemed acceptable. That happens automatically. And I think that's largely aligned with what Keith is saying. Um, and I like in many ways his draft, but even there, I see no need for any of it. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that there are some ways in which the ITF is indeed quite exclusionary, but it is not exclusionary on, on any of the criteria which these drafts set out to address. The ITF is exclusionary primarily on uh, the, you know, the, the energy and time that one needs to be able to afford to engage, and therefore one needs to have adequate resources, you know, in terms of support and company and, and income or time to be able to engage. And it is also exclusionary because much of its activities are funded by major market participants who want to see their standards adopted in this space. Uh, and the game is to, you know, get your products, you know, to, to be compatible with the standards without making too many enemies. And while you're not making too many enemies, you're, you're going to you know, play hardball in this space. And I feel that often 
the IETF excludes people like me who are not directly funded by a major market participant, but engage with it as a hobby. Uh, so I'm often on the outside. Victor, if right. you go on. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll keep it. I'll keep it brief. I get it. Well, well, but no. I, I mean, is this relevant to the dispatch? Yes, I think it is relevant to the dispatch because, in my view, none of these documents need to be published anywhere or discussed any further, uh, because the IT the problem that we have of exclusionary behavior at the ITF is not a problem of these kinds of terms. It is the kind of rough and tumble politics of getting things you know, over the line that you know, makes the ITF a difficult place. And none of it has anything to do with you know, race or offensive language or any of those things. The ITF is a very harsh environment in which one negotiates you know, ultimately technical standards, but it is not these kinds of things that make it so. Uh, uh, I'll probably have more to say, but this is the, the opening remark. Uh, perhaps I should hear what others have to say first. Okay, thanks. Um, John Levine. Uh... Hi there. Um, well, Victor said some of what I was going to say, but this is partly with reference to Keith's draft, but in general, um, one out one outcome that, that that would not work would be to dump this in the lap of of the RFC editors production center and staff. I mean, we've already had somebody say, "Hey, we can't decide whether to use this potentially concerning word, so we'll just flag it and and ask the editors to fix it." And they can't do that. That's not their job. They're contractors. They're not language police. So while if we came up with an outcome, you know, there was a style guide. You know, if we wanted to have had su suggested terms to use or not use as part of the style guide, that would be fine. But it, but <clears throat> the decisions about what language goes into the document still has to remain with the authors and the working groups and the IETF, you know, and not with some, you know, we, we can't punt it to outside outside authorities because that's not how we work. Um, as far as moving stuff forward, um, I think of the three drafts, I find bronze by far the best the best basis to, to go forward with, but I would give some thought to what Victor said about um, are we spinning up a lot of process for something that's not our real problem? All right. Um, Dan, you're next on the list. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I guess I, I, I want to second what Jim said. Uh, I, I've, I've gotten contacted by and two separate occasions of people telling me that that Mallory's draft is an RFC and that it's IETF direction in this in this uh, arena, and it, it, it's a credible amount of pushback I have to make because of the, the misconceptions. I don't know why this is getting traction, but it is. Uh, so regarding the the issue of dispatching, uh, you know, I I think I'd like to agree with Victor that it would be I'd just like to see this go away. But sadly, I think that there's too many people that that. I, that might not be possible. I think I think a boff would be a shit show, and I think a, a a working group would be a little bit more managed shit show, but it would still be pretty bad. So I'm I, I think probably an AD sponsored draft. To that end, then I think uh, the best draft is probably bronze because it it does I think balance these these uh, contentious issues more. More appropriately, I think uh, I do like s section three two, where he talks about you know we we follow the the world and the world's use of language, and we do not dictate how the world should be using language. And that I think is is the a direction we should go. That I don't see in, for instance, uh, draft nodal. Uh, regarding draft nodal, I think if we were to to take away all of the offensive and unprofessional parts of that document, I think we'd be left with pr pretty much the the boilerplate. For an internet draft, so uh, that I draft, I hope that we could dispatch to a round file, but and I would hope that maybe Keith would join uh, Ron and uh, going forward with a, an AD sponsored draft. Thank you. All right, and Ron, you put yourself in the queue here uh, in the general topic. I did. I think I covered most of the stuff in the other thing. I think one of the, the things that we're skating around here is that 
part of the point of this document is not for ourselves, uh, but is as something that can be used, uh, if I could say, as a stick in the outside world, as something that, as Dan said there, some of the drafts we have here have already been used in the outside world as CDITF is already doing this. And I feel like there is an intent to use this document in the rest of the world to say CDITF is doing this. His so clearly, clearly this group believes in this and you should follow. Um, I think it's important that we don't do something that that's not benefiting our mission um, and become, I guess, a pawn or part of the the outside world process here. So I, I would like to to keep us focused on improving us necessarily and not in fighting the world's battles. All right, um, Michael, you had a general insert into the queue. Uh, I I wasn't in general. I was asking for Keith. But if you ask me, my general opinion is that I. I most I agree with several people who said that I think that a boff is going to be a real problem. Um, and I guess in the end, I would like to see Keith and Broad produce an AD sponsored document. All righty. Um, and uh, uh, just to insert something so that people think about this, because I've now heard the comment several times, AD sponsored, and we'll get input from Melissa, I'm sure, eventually. But if there is work to be done, if there are changes to be made, can that all happen during an AD sponsored last call? Or will there need to be a small working group? It might be something to cogitate on and comment on. Um, because I'm sure Alyssa will have a thought on this. Uh, Mallory, you were up. Thanks. Um, so I just wanted to comment generally about where I think the way forward is with this particular discussion and what um, comes out of it. Without the original draft, so the draft that Niels and I put together, I don't think the other two make a lot of sense. For example, like what Keith is saying is that we need to have, we're raising the bar actually on comments and suggested changes to language, which should be rather benign and suggest maybe the wording could be improved. Um, the DNS group no longer uses this, that sort of thing. But because these are now flagged as contentious, we're going to have to do extra due diligence to sort of pass that bar. And I think that that would be um, actually more stifling, I find it, um, than it would be. And, and also just to say again that I think um, because this conversation started in 2018, there were a lot of these questions that folks were asking around acknowledging the harm. Is the harm legitimate? This draft came out of that. It was just simply to put all the thoughts in one place that were um, in various places through a long thread and try to get some citations and some backing behind it because folks were having they were having questions about like is this actually a problem so that was the origin of this draft and i think for that reason it does summarize really well what the conversations have been and the way forward um and then i would just say about bronze that i think the biggest difference is that that one to me reads as the most reactionary i think in a vacuum bronze draft doesn't make a whole lot of sense and it and it's clearly it, because it doesn't have a lot of citations, uh, because it's not really approached in the same sort of rational way with logical outputs like our original draft is, that it's kind of meant to make everyone feel a little bit better about this whole discussion, which I totally understand as a, you know, we do, we ha there has been a lot of really difficult conversations, um, but as a BCP, I don't think it really fits. Um, and I do think that we, you know, I know I've gotten a lot of pushback from including the part about the harm of the discussion itself in our draft. The reason it's included is because it's important. If we're trying to um, actually affect change, sometimes it's going to feel a little uncomfortable, but I agree with Keith. I think the IETF can handle it. I think we can sit with this discomfort in an effort to actually achieve something that's really meaningful and that makes a clear statement like the IESG has already done. Um, that we're committed to, to diversity and inclusion in the IETF. So that's why I think that the original draft just needs to stand and move forward. I am happy to make changes. I agree with Andrew's email earlier today where it doesn't need to have the specific examples in, anymore, and I'd be happy to make changes like that. So thanks so much. All right. Uh, Nico, you are up next. 
unmuting. So uh, regarding dispatch issues, um, so I, I've expressed before that I stopped using this language long ago in my documents uh, using the precautionary principle. I don't really have evidence that it is exclusionary. Uh, I think the same principle says that we should start by publishing these as informational. We could publish any one or all three of these or any others that come along and see how it works. And I think the effect has been had, right? These, these terms will not be used again. Uh, certainly master slave, whitelist, blacklist. I'm not sure about master other things, master key, master whatever, uh, because for example, draft Nadal does not actually mention those. Uh, but in any case, I think that the effect has been had. I don't think we'll even see internet drafts that actually use these terms, let alone RFCs. So I don't think there's any urgency to have a BCP or a standards track RFC. Uh, I noticed that some of these are, uh, internet drafts actually uh, are seeking publication as a standard, but I think informational followed by promotion to BCP would be a very good thing. And not least, Publication as informational can't really be stopped. Only the IESG can stop it. So, can we know what the IESG is going to say? So, let them proceed as informational. And regarding a home, certainly they can proceed on the ISC if they're going to be informational. Although, I don't really have an opinion as to where they should go if not uh, on the ISC. Um, again, I, I agree with some of what has been said about a BOF or a working group, so I, I don't know. I don't have any opinion on that. And I wanted to respond to a couple of things that were said earlier regarding the RFC publication center and the RSC setting uh, any kind of language policies. I agree that the RFC, uh, the RPC cannot do it. Uh, the RSC should be able to do it, perhaps, if there's a process. The IETF is about process. So process requires, you know, a forum to discuss changes and, you know, everything, including uh, how do we determine consensus and, of course, uh, appeals processes as well. But I think the ERC is probably the best place in a way. I think, you know, provided we give them the right process. Um, lastly, regarding exclusionary policies or exclusionary nature of IETF, you know, I, I've had some conversations with some folks about inclusion as well. I, I think ISOC used to have a program for uh, sponsoring people from, from poor countries or, or something along those lines. I don't know the details. And apparently it no longer does. And I think that including, going out of our way to include people is, is certainly a very productive thing we could be doing. Whereas arguing about what might be exclusionary, right? Because, you know, even though we've seen research and I, I commend Mallory for including research, you know, references in her draft, I'm not sure that the research is of sufficient quality or, you know, that it establishes the premise sufficiently. So I think we can focus on inclusion because we can certainly make a difference in that side of things. And on the side of exclusionary language, it's just kind of, eh, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't exclusionary, we don't know. And in any case, we won't be using this language anymore, regardless of whether we even publish one RFC, let alone three. That's it. All right. Um, Barbara, you're next in the queue. And a reminder, uh, I see Keith unmuted if you would mute. Um, please, no. you're not speaking. Okay. Barbara, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I had to find that mute button on the <laughs> second screen, you know. <laughs> The other direction. Else, you know, yeah. Is it, do I have to scroll up or down? Um, I would like to see um, an RFC published. I think it should probably be along the BCP. And what I would like is something that creates a maintained list of terminology to be cautious about, about using. And I think that bronze, you know, in my looking it over is a really good start. I think Keith has some good points in his. Um, honestly, I 
don't think we need a whole lot of the history. And much of that is because, number one, the IETF does not have the expertise to peer review all of those um, references that talk about the exclusionary. And also because my reading of a lot of the critiques of a lot of those references suggests that they were not sufficiently uh, good studies. And, you know, I even looked at like Los Angeles did the reaction of we're going to ban anybody who uses these terms in documentation. And the gentleman who created, you know, the initial study or in paper that Los Angeles was reacting to said, oh, no, that's not at all what you should do. And my study was totally horrible. And you shouldn't, you know, do some reaction like this on the basis of my study. The reason we need awareness of these words is simply because as language changes, language changes, we don't need a whole lot of research to prove that language changes over time. But what we're seeing is a rather rapid change of the use of certain terms in this industry. And different people in different parts of the world may not be fully aware of words that are going out of vogue for their perceived um, because of people's perceptions. And we need to be aware of those. And therefore, it's good to have a list and the list can have references of where they're going out of vogue and who's saying don't use these in our you know, software documentation, whatever. Um, and then it's simply a decision as, you know, for working group drafts as you do a working group. But anyway, I'm, I digress. I support having something published, you know, with an AD. I'm a bit concerned about the ability for it to be crafted by multiple people, but I don't know. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Keith, you put yourself in the queue. Yes, okay. Um, I think back to Victor's point in, about what is exclusionary, and uh, I think the statement has been made that one of the ways in which we're exclusionary is that people come into the IETF and we don't speak and use and use the terminology and think and model things like they do and that's a, and that is exclusionary and I want to emphatically disagree with that idea fundamentally what we do in IETF is try to find rough agreement among people with diverse perspectives so anybody who comes in and says you guys don't think like we do or you guys don't think like you're we're supposed to or you guys don't talk like you're supposed to is going to have a difficult time functioning in IETF because that mindset does not lend itself to consensus building and to the extent that we are exclusionary because we make decisions by consensus I, I think it's probably not a good use of the word, and it might in some sense be a feature. We are actually more inclusive than a lot of groups because anybody can participate. So that's that point. Um, some other points, I do think that publishing, I wouldn't want to publish any of these documents in their current form or say we're going to base you know, a, a, a document on small changes from one of the existing documents. I don't like the idea of publishing them, them as informational. I do think we there's somehow a document needs to be produced out of this. I'm a bit skeptical about doing it as an AD sponsored document. It might work, but this is something that is at least potentially controversial and and could could affect the whole community. And so it might actually need to be something with a bit more visibility, even though it will be more difficult. So that's kind of where I sit with that at this point. All right. Thank you. Um, Niels. Hi all. Thanks so much, Pete. Um, you hear me okay? Yep, just fine. Go ahead. Excellent. So several times it has now been mentioned that norms from the outside world kind of permeate the IETF by itself, as if it would happen by itself. But I think we see that the IETF really does not look like the rest of the world. We have very different behaviors, different meetings, different text structures. Our tooling even looks very different from what other people use. 
that's not necessarily bad, but that kind of twists around that idea that will automatically start to do what other people do. Next to that, the IETF also does not really look like the rest of the world. The IETF looks like a really particular part of the world. So the IETF itself has not diversified as much as we wanted. As much, and if we want to do that, then perhaps we should take the norms into account, not just of all the people that are already here, but the people that we think should be here as well. And perhaps we could then look towards people who have extensively studied the interrelation between language, race, power, technology and infrastructure. Because the infrastructures we build have a great impact on society and we should also take that responsibility because it's not just technical. So I do hope that we can continue with this work and maybe indeed ask people who have more experience with diversity and making communities more diverse and language more diverse, help them to input in the process of the draft AD. I agree that that is not perhaps the best work, the working group would be a best place because maybe the IETF does not have all the expertise that is needed. So I'm not saying we should outsource it to another group, but perhaps we could find a group of people that could help advise the AD and us on how to make next steps and people that could perhaps assess the, uh, the literature and, uh, and best practices if people feel that the current research or uh, uh, papers that they do not know are currently are not good enough, maybe they could look for expertise because I think, yeah, well, that's, we know that we, you know what expertise you have, you know what expertise you don't have. So uh, I hope with that we can, uh, we can continue to work. Thanks so much. Yes. Um... Bob, you are next in line. Hi. Um, yeah, a couple of thoughts. So, it, first of all, it seems to me that some of these drafts are like architecture documents in the ITF that are very useful to have the discussion to talk about the issues, but can be very hard to actually ever get completed and published, I think. Many of us are aware of these, uh, which is they have value, but not necessarily as the published RFC. Um, so I, I, I guess I, I lean towards a short document that basically says we're going to have a list of words. I think the I looked at what was published on GitHub. I think it looks quite good. I think that's. I think that sort of thing we could actually get a consensus around because it um, I didn't see anything I found objectionable. Um, and so basically a document that points to saying we're going to have an external list and, you know, for example, like this one, um, and then it's something that all authors can um, can look at and maybe ID nits uh, does some checking, um, I think would be just fine. I, I don't think we need a working group to do that. I think an eight short AD sponsored draft would be fine. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Martin, you were next on the list. Yeah, I just uh, would like to say that I, I want to concur with Barbara's remarks, but also in the ITF stream rather than the ISC. Uh, I don't have a strong opinion on whether it's AD sponsored or, or a working group. Um, there are things I like about all three of the drafts, frankly, um, but I do think that in the normal draft specifically, it's important to have some actionable uh, words. Uh, I mean, industry, I mean, those words, I think the industry is really converging on that already, and we just really need to catch up and keep up and uh, incorporate that somehow, although I really have no opinion on the editorial details of how much explanatory text there is. And I, I do have a question, like are, do the authors have fundamental disagreements about this or can we productively have them work together to create this sort of best of all possible worlds here along these three drafts? Or are there just di differences that make that difficult to resolve um, in a, like a friendly editorial process? Uh, the the authors are welcome to jump in or not as they see fit uh, to to address Martin. 
Um, I, I will mention that, you know, if the dispatch move is to a working group, uh, the chair of said working group might decide to query different people, maybe the authors of these drafts or someone else to be the uh, work group document editor, but. Uh, I don't see anyone jumping in. Uh, okay. Uh, although uh, there are some comments in, in the uh, chat. Um, no, just, just, no, sorry, sorry, just, just, just yeah. Mark. Just, uh, um, well, I, I guess we don't know if they're disagreements or not, but I, well, I found it interesting that really, I and mean, some people don't want to do anything, but, but pretty much the whole spectrum found something to like about one of the drafts. Uh, you know, somewhere on the, so maybe there's some common ground that we can find here. Uh, I, I'm more optimistic about that after this discussion than I was uh, two hours ago. Thanks. Um, so, Elliot, you were next up to bat. Okay, so hi again, everybody. Um, uh, I, first of all, uh, thanks, uh, thanks all three sets of authors um, for the drafts. Uh, there's, I think, something in each of them that uh, I've enjoyed reading. Um, I was going to talk just for a moment about uh, modalities of work. If we dispatch uh, to the area director um, and we end up having to last call debate a lot of stuff on the IETF or the IETF last call list, I think we all can predict that that won't be fun. Um, and so it may be the case that um, we would like to have a working group, but a working group with a certain modality. Um, and so these, this is just maybe some thoughts for the, for the general area director um, and for the dispatch chairs to, to take back. Um, one possibility is that we dispatch to a, if you will, a working group that um, would be a, sort of akin to the old style working group that Alexa used to do, where he would say, you have this particular small task to do. Um, you can talk about, uh, you know, start with this draft and then, and then talk, you know, talk about it. You're never going to meet um, and, um, uh, you know, get done quick. Um, another modality would be almost the inverse of that, which is on the whole, we'd expect you to hold a lot of interims because the communications and email don't seem to be particularly uh, fruitful. And um, that way you can have, you guys can get FaceTime and talk through some of these things and hopefully, uh, you know, build your issues list. Um, you know, MNOT has, has demonstrated the power of the issues list um, in, in both the HTTP this and, and, um, uh, and the quick working groups at some point. So he's, you know, there's leadership there in terms of how, how to do it. But this is another possibility um, in terms of, how to go about it. What I would add, just to finish, is while I have a preference for bronze draft um, in its starting form, as we, as we might say, um, I don't know that I would want to lose the work that Mallory and Niels um, have done, but it might not be that I want it to be the, BC, the BCP, um, but that supporting information is something that I think could be further developed. Now, where it could be further developed raises an important question, which is, do we have, as Barbara said, the expertise to really review the work um, in that context? Do we, do, we, do we know how to review the research work? Do we have the right people in the room? I don't know. And that's a problem. And it's something that I'd like to work on fixing you know, from an industry standpoint, um, which is to say to, to, to go through my organization to try and, and, and drive some some questions about this, and I know that other people are thinking along the same lines. Um, but I did want to add that I thought that that work was interesting, and I just don't I don't know how to dispatch it um, to, to where it could be productive. But I do like um, the the work that's that's gone on. Thanks, Elliot. Um, Victor, you were next in the queue. Yes. Um, just um, perhaps I miscommunicated a little bit because when hearing Keith's response to uh, to what I said about exclusion, I just want to clarify that a little bit. Um, what I really want to say is that the IETF is by far uh, the most inclusive group in terms of the ability to participate uh, that I've seen. Um, 
Uh, anybody can join anytime. You can pipe in. Uh, to the extent that I meant, you know, that the ITF is also a difficult place to be included. It is in the process of in, uh, reaching consensus for for views that might be uh, uh, right but not popular. Uh, or various other reasons why one might have a hard time bringing one colleagues, one's colleagues along. It's a difficult process. So to the extent that there's exclusion in the ITF, it's largely about whether one's ideas will or will not be accepted and the difficulties of doing that. But otherwise, the evidence that the ITF is exclusionary of participation is thin and very questionable. On the other hand, what I really did try to say was that though the ITF is not exclusionary, it is not possible and it's not going to be representative because the people who can afford the energy and time to participate in this very difficult process are unusual people and we cannot change that. So we cannot arrive at quote unquote diversity, no matter how hard we try, if diversity means representative of the broader community. That's not going to happen. It is not a reasonable goal and we shouldn't go there. Uh, uh, now, the other thing uh, is that I still want to defend the idea that the best outcome here is to acknowledge the fact that language is changing, publish none of these documents and move on. And with that, I want a couple of examples as to their content. For example, today, rereading Draft Nodell, I saw that Draft Nodell says, by the way, you know, man in the middle is a terrible construct. It's not even standard and it's, you know, exclusionary. It mentions the word man or something. I don't know what exactly is the problem with it. Uh, but, you know, I opened up my copy of Schneier. I could, you know, if you want, I can put my camera on, you know, here it is, you know. Schneier applied cryptography. Uh, you know, you can you can find a copy in the nearest bookstore. Um, in the index, I find man in the middle attacks with all kinds of descriptions and language. You know, for people practiced in the art who understand what a man in the middle attack is, there is no not a single mention of an on path attack in that in that book or any other book you'll find on cryptography. Um, these are uh, retroactive constructions of problems where there are none, by and large. Now, I agree that at this point, I would be reluctant to use my, to use whitelist, blacklist in most cases. They're not really such good words, not because they're racist, mind you. To me, blacklist means, is a reference to, you know, McCarthyism, right? And, you know, the, the blacklists of, you know, of the 50s, perhaps to somebody else, they mean something else. Uh, given that it means different things to different people, fine, let's, let's not use it because it might evoke different things to different people. But we don't need to go there. This is already happening organically. Uh, the, the entire thing about master is nonsense. Master is a word we use in polite society. If it's okay in newspapers and on the radio and in TV to talk about master's degrees and master whatever, it is, it, and even to, to talk about slavery, it is not a rude word. It is not a swear word. It's not the N word. It's not the F bomb. It's just the word slave, and we use it every day, and nobody gets offended when they hear the word slave. So, uh, most of these things are fishing for a problem where there is none. Uh, you're right. We're master carpenter. I have a master's degree in mathematics. There are master copies of records and so on. And I think I mentioned in the email discussion in IETF that while I don't use master and slave name servers anymore, to me, a master zone file being master in the sense of original rather than controlling is a far more apt description than anything else I've seen. And while others come close, the, this one is already as well established in documentation, has clearly no hostile intent and nobody's going to be offended when they read about master's own files. So what problem exactly are we trying to solve here other than posturing? And the posture, if it's really to change our language, language will change organically. If we want to posture, I question the wisdom and, and, and frankly, sincerity of, of the need to posture in this Okay, space. Victor, Victor, that's the end of that. Right. And it's simply because this comment about sincerity is out of line. I'm sorry. I don't want you to. I don't want anybody to impugn motives to impugn okay. motives to any of the authors on. Okay. This. I, I just fine. I, I withdraw that. 
it, motives have been imputed to me and in this, you know. So yeah. that does not give you the right to oh, okay. motives to others. Okay, you, fine. You let the chairs know if there is an issue mm. on that and move mm -hmm. along. Okay, sure. Understood. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. That's it. Uh, Andrew, you're next up. Uh, sorry, coming off mute. Uh, th thank you. Um, uh, well, firstly, I should have said an apologies. For, I, there were some typos in my email early today, so I apologize for offending the eyes of people that read read my uh, email. Um, my my spell check was switched off, um, <laughs> and I clearly not had enough coffee. Um, I quite liked Barbara's comment earlier. Um, uh, not her exact words, but about its reference to words to be used with caution. I thought that was helpful. Um, uh, and perhaps a rather softer reference, and that, that, that's a good way of phrasing where my mind is at on on this stuff. Because I, uh, I, I was I'd forgotten earlier, but I was I remembered some comments on the original IATF list from people in Eastern Europe who had experience of words that they told, were told they could no longer use, and that made made them feel deeply uncomfortable because they'd seen how their society evolved. Um, as a consequence of that. So I think uh, it's it's worth bearing that in mind that there are some people um, on the list who have had a lot more experience in that sort of thing than probably most of us have had. Um, and I think we should learn from, from their prior experience um, on that. Um, on, on, on the matter in hand specifically, uh, it, it may be a relatively small part of a larger issue um, um, around inclusion. But because of the airing it's been given and the way it was positioned when the document was sort of delivered from the ITF, uh, I think something needs to be published um, rather than nothing. And as you would have seen from my email, I think bronze document is the uh, right starting point, but could usefully be extended. But I think it's the right um, sort of foundation uh, to build from. Um, I think the example. It should absolutely not be a US centric document, otherwise it completely misses the point about diversity. Um, and that was one of the issues I had with reading some of the drafts that they seemed to not understand the rest of the world um, and were, were completely driven from a US experience. Uh, and I think that's unhelpful. Um, and I think if something is published, it could potentially be the first in a series of documents on inclusion. Um, which broad now I think it was Bron that, that referenced other or somebody certainly referenced other areas of uh, inclusion which were maybe more important. Um, so if it was the first in a series, that would be a valuable um, contribution. Um, so uh, I wouldn't have said this was the most important issue, but since it has had so much airtime, there needs to be something coming out of it as a result. Um, uh, so I would suggest dispatching Bron's document, uh, but with some additional work to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, skipping Rich, who took himself out of the queue. Brian, it looks like you're up next. Uh, yes. So, uh, all I really wanted to say is that one element that hasn't been mentioned in this discussion, which I think is relevant to the dispatch question is the review teams in the ITF, because I'm in one of them, and we get to look at everything that comes up for last call. I can't remember a single case where my review has said, you might want to change the word X to the word Y, but, you know, whatever happens, I think the key practical thing that we should dispatch is to make sure the review teams are all in tune with this issue and that people are watching out for it without needing a specific allow list and block list of words right it's just we have a process and we should just make sure we use it okay Be before you jump off brian uh the one thing that was brought up i believe on the list but also was mentioned in part in keith's document was the uh, early versus late review issue um, do you think we could get into trouble if the review teams are the the place where these things take place? It's possible because if um, you know a document has been developed over three years and includes master slave as a fundamental 
part of its terminology, you might get a lot of pushback from the working group if they had to change it to term A and term B instead of master and slave. Right? But, but so in a sense, yeah, it's a backstop. And the earlier review that happens is the better. It happened to me, by the way, a person who's on this call reviewed a zero zero draft of mine said, you might want to change this word. And I changed it. Right? And it wasn't master slave to the record. Um, so yeah, early review is even better, but I don't think we really need an early review language police uh, team, do we? It's it's just as, as I've said, it's 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 organic. It's something we do as as responsible professionals these days. Very good. Uh, Nico, you were next up. Hi. So. Uh, first of all, I'd like to second what Brian just said. Uh, I, I actually don't think we need an early review. I mean, I think people will review and they will respond accordingly as they go. Um, uh, also, uh, I wanted, you know, something Elliot said made me think a little bit. And, you know, I think we saw a lot of debate on this. Uh, very strenuous debate, and part of it, there's a lot, a number of reasons for it. One of them is that this does have a, a list of, essentially, it is a function, a, a form of a prior restraint. And I mentioned in my in my post on the list that, you know, avoiding prior prior restraint would be a good idea. Uh, for people who are not familiar with the term in the U.S., it basically means you can get punished after the fact rather than, you know, as you do it. Or, or having devices to prevent you from doing it. Uh, so, uh, for me, that means publishing is informational and seeing how it goes. Uh, I, like I said, I think the effect has been had. And I think it is a bit, uh, it causes friction to uh, ask for prior restraint. Um, so, you know, so I, I kind of like Braun's draft and, and Keith's draft uh, a lot better than Mallory's in this regard. And if you take that tack, I think you'll find a lot less opposition. And uh, again, if you follow the ISC, you know, you can't really stop this. Uh, so I'm not objecting to publication. And I'm not, and I won't. And I especially won't if, you know, some of the really objectionable language that I called out earlier today is not really there or is softened. Uh, so I'm not going to bring it up. And lastly, a lot of the emotions and the U.S. centrism uh, that we've seen, you know, that, that someone brought up earlier, I think, Andrew, you know, might be related to all of the problems we're having in the U.S. right now. I'm looking at my notes, by the way, if you're wondering. Uh, in the U.S. specifically, and it might be election related to some degree. I'm not questioning anybody's motivations here, Pete. I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, the emotions might be related to that. And so to some degree, you know, holding off a little bit, waiting a few weeks might actually help. So I think when we revisit this in January, we might find that we don't have bruising fights on any lists about this. We might publish one or two or three drafts. And, you know, and I would in, also recommend that, you know, you merge some of these perhaps, you know, get together as co-authors. And lastly, there was a point about uh, that Elliot made about expertise, our lack of expertise. It's true, we do lack expertise in this area. We're not social scientists. We're not, um, yeah, we, we don't, we didn't go to college for it, right? We don't have degrees in it. And uh, to some degree, this is something that, yeah, maybe has to come from outside, but remember that even in academia, there's a lot of debate about these things. So it might take time to arrive at a, uh, a consensus where people don't really object strenuously anymore. And again, since the effect has been had, maybe nobody will care next year. Maybe waiting a little bit might actually help. That's it. All right. Uh, Mallory, you were next in the queue. Yep, I just wanted to say a few things that have actually been put into the chat, but just to remind everyone that there are, like, I'm not an outsider. I've been in this community for 
some years, um, same with Niels, we're not coming in from the outside and we do have the expertise. I would say that more is needed, but that also goes hand in hand. So if you want ex- if you want diversity and expertise, you need to also then have appreciate that diversity. And that's this is one small uh, step for that towards that. Um, it's I think th- I do agree. I'll just shift into what I've been hearing that I agree with. I think that um, publishing other drafts besides Neil's and my draft is fine. Um, but again, I find them. I find the other two drafts, I find Keith's and Braun's to be a bit odd in a vacuum. So I do think that um, they're they're reacting to something, and this is sort of the thing that establishes what that is. If we want to pare it down, I'm happy to do that too. Um, but yeah, but my main point was just to remind everyone that it's not that there are outsiders coming in to talk about this issue. It's also not that we're anticipating to increase the amount of outsiders that are coming in because there are currently people in this community to feel strongly about this and that there is expertise within it. And it would be really um, as a way of continuing to be sensitive and mindful of the discussion. Thanks. All right. Uh, my scroll is getting a little more difficult. Um, oh, Nick, sorry. There you are. Uh, Nick Doey. Yeah, thanks. I, I uh, want to comment briefly on goals. It actually sounds to me from the presentations of what I've heard from some people in the queue that there might be more alignment on goals than, than I had initially realized on uh, increasing readability and accessibility of the language that we use in documents. Um, I also think it's important that we're talking about non-goals or, or that there are other problems that this won't um, solve. Uh, I, I think I think that's important in terms of inclusion and participation. Um, I, I wouldn't conclude from that that this isn't a real problem. Um, I have certainly seen in in professional communities or in talking with my students at Berkeley that this would be a problem. Um, but the fact that it might be a problem for some people doesn't mean it's a problem for everyone, or that it's the only problem or, or inhibitor. Regarding dispatch, I this is something I know less about, but I'd be curious. Um, I think there's been a lot of interest in uh, reviews or uh, tooling or style guides, and I'm not clear what's necessary for us to decide in terms of dispatch in order to enable updates to the style guide or updates to this GitHub repo or um, or other of those sort of lightweight documents. I, I don't know what we need to do to um, use those tools, but that seems like an important thing for us to figure out in dispatch. Yeah, um, and Nico, and if he wants to, one of the questions that your comment and, re- and Nico's kind of put together that I'd like to hear is, you know, is a BCP which says, you know, you should consult the the style guide, um, and you know, we've added these things to the style guide uh, dispatch that we're shooting for a BCP, but it's going to be um, you know, pointing to something else rather than uh, directive, whether that's a good set of solutions. I'm trying to wrap my head around whether there's support for that or not. Um, well, yeah, Nico, if you wanted to jump back in. Yeah, so, so what you said actually reminded me of something I've said before as well, which is that we can say, uh, we can use informative language rather than normative language. And it's, it's, I'm a lot more comfortable with that. So if we have a BCP, that says we don't say this or whatever, as opposed to thou shall not say this. You know that, that feels a lot, lot better. You know, and I'm, and again, a BCP that doesn't say that you know in July or August people were racist on the list or whatever. Please don't do that, right? Like I, I will appeal that. Um, and uh, you know, going back to the point about expertise. You know, the point was specific, was general to the IETF. I'm not calling out anybody as uh, inexpert in this area. I'm not denying that some might be or might not be or whatever. I'm not making that statement. I'm saying that the, the lion's share of the participation at the IETF is by people who don't normally spend a lot of time researching social 
anything, social no, policy, I understood, social studies. I understood the point. And, you know, so I, 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 that was not an attack on anybody. Uh, that was just a, a very general point. Appreciate it. All right, back to my queue. Uh, uh, Colin, I think you were next. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, just fine. Excellent. Um, so I'm kind of wondering what the goal of uh, some of this work is to be from this group. Um, are, are we um, trying to make some very concrete recommendations about language use and then at that point declare ourselves done? Or are we trying to maybe start to address the sort of broader, longer term problem um, and make some sort of statements of it intent that we're trying to be more inclusive? Uh, in the IETF, um, whilst also giving some concrete suggestions about uh, improving the, uh, the language we use as, as one step towards, and possibly one step of many towards doing that. I think one of the things I like about the draft from Mallory and Niels is that it um, recognizes that um, you know, in inclusivity is something that we need to um, think about and we need to pay, pay attention to in, in the way we do our work. And um, that seems to me to be less clear in the other drafts. And you know, wh whichever way we go forward, I think it, it may be um, worth, worth thinking about what sort of statement we're trying to make here. And whether we're just answering the very narrow specific question or if we're trying to address the broader issues, or at least start to address the broader issues. Thank you. All right. Uh, Rich, you were back in the queue. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a lot easier when there's a real mic line, you can get up and sit down. For <laughs> uh, okay, so a couple of points. Uh, I'm concerned about the cost of us doing nothing in terms of perception in the technical community. Um, certainly in the US, we've seen a lot of organizations uh, move rapidly to say, no, we, you know, we reject exclusionary language, whether or not there's a academic basis behind that. And as Elliot pointed out, we're, some people are trying to work on that. Um, so I'm concerned that people go, oh yeah, the ITF. Well, well, I already knew it was a bunch of old middle-aged white guys sitting around designing low-level protocols. So, I, you know, another sign of that. Um, and I know that that argument will rub many people's feathers the wrong way within the ITF, just cause, uh, they look badly on us for not doing it. That doesn't mean we're not right. Um, related to that, the argument that, oh, it's already evolving, so we don't have to do anything. It's a solved problem. Um, yeah, maybe it's a solved problem the way IPv6 is a solved problem for IPv4, but we still try to push things forward. And we should. Uh, we are not independent of the outside world, um, and all of us live in it to some extent or another, and the ITF. Um, has published statements and documents that say things like the internet is for the users. Um, I totally agree with what Colin was saying uh, most recently, just said about, you know, it's probably, maybe it's a tip of the iceberg or maybe it's a shoal on which we're getting ourselves beached, but the larger problem of inclusivity, inclusivity and uh, diversity um, growth um, is a concern for the ITF or it should be. I uh, used to see Jari try to get really hard to get new work to come in. Uh, I've been involved with the newcomers program for a long time, um, and it's the same kind of problems. So there are social norms that we are evolving, we're getting better at. Um, this, I think, may be part of it. I'd be concerned if we didn't do anything. I'd also be concerned if it were just sent to an area director. AD sponsored, it should really be a, some kind of statement from the organization. Um, and so in terms of dispatch, I'm going to actually recommend that we encourage the IAB to start up an inclusive inclusivity, diversity and growth program. And these drafts go there. Thank you. All right. Um, Victor, you added yourself to the queue. Uh, hi. Uh, so, uh, uh, back to uh, sort of the question of, of inclusivity specifically, uh, one has to be a little bit careful 
about what whom inclusivity excludes, uh, because it is assumed that when we uh, uh, encourage people to use more inclusive language, that every way in which we do that doesn't then necessarily discourage others. And uh, I think we need to be careful that uh, the kind of ways in which we structure the discussion around what is and isn't appropriate language doesn't then push away people who uh, uh, hold different political priorities and are then ostracized at the ITF for holding those different political views, uh, or doesn't, let's say, ostracize uh, people who, uh, for one reason or another, uh, you know, maybe have some, you know, in this industry, not atypical, you know, some mildly spectrumy sort of issues, and maybe some of us aren't as socially uh, capable as others. Uh, and yet, we don't we don't necessarily want to exclude broad swaths of ITF contributors for whom, in fact, uh, uh, direct policing and direct enforcement of language norms would, in fact, become a barrier to participation. And yet, much softer touches, without explicit lists and with consensus and with organic evolution of language, would present a much lower barrier and a lot less friction. Because if we start having official guides and official lists, they will be sources of endless debate and friction. Whereas if we leave it to people to just feel in their own skin, you know, am I really comfortable saying that for me uh, without being told, no, you can't use it. And then I have to resist and argue about it because now, well, now my feathers are ruffled and I'm now inclined to defend my right to say it because somebody's saying you can't. There can be negative consequences to pushing these buttons too hard, both in terms of exclusion and both in terms of actually promoting the use of the very things we're trying to forbid by bringing them front and center. The softest possible touch, barring evidence, compelling evidence of a deep and structural problem is wise. We don't want to exacerbate and open these wounds and we want to have a demonstrable case of are these actually causing real and and substantive and and also quantitatively real problems. I can't say we can't prove zero. We need to demonstrate that these problems rise to the level where we need to care. All right. I see Joel in the queue next. Thank you, Pete. I I want to disagree with the subtext while agreeing with one part of what has been said a couple of times. So I'll start with the agreement. I I would hope we can get to a point where we can say people should avoid this kind of thing, embrace that kind of thing, and not have a police structure that tries to enforce that. Trying to enforce proper word usage is probably a nightmare. At the same time, I actually think having some word lists is helpful. I have run into several different cases on different ends of the extreme. One case where a word might be objectionable, but I think the right conclusion is to say it's not, but we could write it down. And another case where somebody pointed out a word which I myself used, and when they pointed it out, I went, oh my gosh, I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't ever be using that word. And it's like, none of us are perfect in this. Having some lists that we all can collaborate on to produce recommendations, not requirements, will help us all do a better job. Now, then the question becomes, how the heck to do this? No, an IAB program does not have the eff efficacy or the right structures to do this. Um, I think probably a series of boffs and just violate the rules and have three boffs to 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 at least craft the initial document in a community fashion, not clogging up any other mailing list, seeing if we can get some initial words that we can agree on, whether it's bronze words or Keith's or or Mallory's words suitably massaged, 
and figure out what we want as a starting list and where to put it and how to maintain it thereafter and how to continue the discussion. And maybe then we end up with a with a perpetual working group. I hate those on how to get get the IETF more inclusive, or maybe we decide we don't need it. But I don't think we can charter a working group because I can't imagine what a charter would be. Whereas with a BOF, at least whoever sponsors it can write down a charter and say, look, let's give this a try. If it's wrong, we can update it. And with that, I'll go back to mute. Before you mute, Joe, because uh, it it reminded me of an earlier comment and it's, I sort of want to get my head around. I think you may have started toward an answer uh, at the end. Someone suggested thing. Uh, oh, is Elliot who suggested, you know, uh, the apps area and Alexi in particular use these quick spin up, spin down working groups where um, you, you formed a working group quickly. It was a very targeted uh, discussion uh, and he had mentioned maybe just have a few interims. Is there any um, practical distinction for you between that and a few BOFs that are loosely chartered? There, is, there isn't much of a distinction for me. My experience with those rapid spin up, spin downs is sometimes they work great and sometimes they're disasters. <laughs> so I'm less sanguine, I guess. Okay, no, fair enough. I, I just wanted to kind of put the two together and see if we were heading in a similar direction. That's helpful. Uh, Ron, you were next in the queue. Ron. Excellent, oh, thanks. I think I'm back, I'm back alive now. Um, I wanted to rewind this right back to the start to some degree and say that we have RFC 3935, which is our mission statement for the IATF. Um, it doesn't specify inclusion and diversity as a purpose. Um, the purpose of the IETF is to produce high quality documents that document the internet and improve the internet. Um, and so all of these things either should be with the goal of doing that. Um, so we don't want to include the whole world because there's no way you can produce a high quality document by consensus with thousands of people. Oh, thanks, Niels. If I missed something that has updated that, I will definitely go read that straight after I finish talking. Um, so yeah, anything anything in this effort that we say we want to do these things, we should possibly look at adding that to the mission of the IATF uh, so that we have that as our guide rather than doing it without it being our mission. All right, um, Barbara? Yeah, um, I just, well, I, th I think Joel actually said much of, of what I was thinking, so I don't think I, I need to say much. I was just going to say to me, you know, one of the primary reasons I tend to avoid words like this is not because I know or that they do or don't discourage people. Um, it's just that I know that as these words are promoted around the world as discouraging people, that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. That is, everybody knows this has been said about these words. And then it becomes a case of if you are using these words while knowing that this is the perception of these words, then that's a problem. And so from a self-fulfilling prophecy perspective, that to me is why we really need a list of these words so that people are not unknowingly using them if, it, if they would rather, you know, they need to either knowingly use them or knowingly not use them. Thanks. All right, I don't have anyone left in the queue. We've got about 15 minutes. Um, I. I can give a summary of where I think we're at, but I do want to talk to uh, Alyssa and Francesca afterwards and, and sort of see if we can summarize and and because I'm doing this from memory, not from looking at the notes in in good detail. Um, but I, I definitely heard the sentiment from a few people that they would rather this just not simply not be done that we drop this and let things grow organically. Um, I, I think we've heard a significant amount from other folks that no, we need to do something. There's some question about what form it would take. Um, a lot of sentiment that 
it should not be as prescriptive as at least I think it was first viewed, but that there should be recommendations, maybe a list of words that people should consider not using, or maybe are encouraged not to use. Um, and I think there are different takes on that. Um, I'm not hearing solid support for a BAF, a working group or AD sponsor. I at least, and I again, wanna go through the notes and talk to Francesca and Alyssa about this. I, I think there have been good stated reasons for it not to be AD sponsored and maybe leaning toward a, a BAF that terminates or a short lived working group was more to people's liking. Um, and uh, as for the d documents themselves, um, what I was hearing was there are at least missing pieces from each of the three and at least pieces that people objected to in each of the three and that things needed to be um, mixed, matched and, and put together to accomplish whatever the goal is and, and that's still a little mushy. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hear folks, if you wanna jump in the queue, if you think I've gotten anything wrong, but I think I might've put it squishy enough that I, I, I didn't say anything terribly objectionable. Uh, Bron, you wanted to say something? I wanted to pretty much just repeat what Keith typed into the box there, which is that we have two meetings here and some people were not able to make it to this one. So I think it's important that we don't try and decide anything before the no, next one. Absolutely. And so let me go back and remind you from what I was, uh, trying to say at the beginning uh, to elicit this, I, I think the chairs and, along with the AD want to summarize what this meeting came away with as input to the second meeting. I think that will be helpful and it will focus that second meeting. Um, but even at the end of that second meeting, we're going to summarize that and we're going to put it to the list to make sure we've captured all of the issues and where we think we've ended up and make sure that the dispatch decision gets made on the list so that people who didn't participate in either meeting have a chance to speak up. Um, but absolutely agreed. Whatever we come out with is not a final decision today in any form. So appreciated. Uh, Elliot. Thank you. Um, so uh, thanks for the summary. The only thing I would just add to it is that I think it's important to capture the point that Colin made about scope um, in terms of the scope of the work, because I think that could be a good input to your next meeting. Yeah, I'll try and see if Thank we've you. got enough to even make a comment about where people are with the scope or whether that'll just be a next meeting topic. Um, but yeah, I appreciate that. I'll try and summarize. Uh, what Thanks. We I mean, if that's a it, we're going for both a working group. This could be something that could be discussed as part of uh, the charter discussion. The charter yeah. for yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mallory, you were next up. Great. I just wanted to chime in with a couple of things um, around expectations between now and the next meeting. So I don't think that there is clarity, like there have been in, has been in the past, about what needs to change with um, meals in my draft. So. We're not going to make any changes between now and then. And I would just like to ask the chairs if we could please explicitly put Alyssa and others on the agenda to talk about the repository, because I feel like that didn't feature enough. We got to it towards the end, and I'm happy to see Alyssa in the queue right now and that towards the end people were referencing it more. But I think that that is really actually the main show, and it would be nice to give it dedicated time next week. Yeah, thanks. No, that's, that's fair enough. Uh, we'll make sure that that gets on the agenda. And um, I will, like I said, I, I think the chairs will try and go back through the notes and summarize what we heard as um, the sense of the room about what changes need to be made, ta things taken out, added to each document, if that information is there in the notes and summarize that as a jumping off point for the second meeting. Uh, Robert, you are next. So I wanted to um, push back just a little bit on your characterization that there were uh, 
not that there wasn't a lot of support for moving this thing forward as AD sponsored. I think when you go back through the minutes carefully, you'll see that there there was some. Um, there were probably also good arguments against, but I don't want to um, have folks accidentally slip into discarding AD sponsor as an option. Um, Fair enough. Uh, no, take an under advisement. On the blurb in the in the in the that are currently that's currently in the notes. Yep. Uh, I, I've taken a, a good point and um, you're right. Uh, I should have characterized it as several people in support uh, and uh, some uh, uh, strong arguments against as well. So, uh, yes, we should put it that way. Um, Alyssa, maybe you'll get to be last. Uh yeah, just picking up on that, I, I just think it's important to remember, um, like, what is the difference really between AD sponsored and the other path, the other common path, which is via working group. And it's really just like about the process of working on the document up to the point of IETF last call. So I think there was a little bit of misunderstanding there that an AD sponsored document still, if it gets published as an RFC, has IETF consensus. So it will go through the last call process. You know, there will be a, a, a call for comment that the entire community will have an opportunity to comment on on the last call mailing list. So um, just wanted to clarify that because it's not it's not like it's it doesn't have the imprimatur of the IETF uh, in the way that other consensus RFCs does. It, I think it certainly would if that's if that's what came to pass. And so I think it might be useful for um, as the, the next follow on conversations here. To maybe split out the question of of do people want an RFC or not, and then what are the other activities that people want or not? Um, because really, like that's what working groups produce. You know, they usually they produce RFCs, um, and I can appreciate looking at the other models um, uh, of you know a series of BOFs or working group that doesn't publish documents or something. But it might be just nice to just kind of nail down the, the question of document or no document um, and, and which path people like. And then also have a section, you know, speaking more to the points that Colin made and others about other things that could be done and and the broader scope of, of diversity issues potentially, although there's, of course, a lot of history around diversity initiatives in the ITF. Um, on the on the GitHub repo, I'm not particularly interested in speaking about it. If somebody else wants to speak about it at the next one, that's fine, but I don't think it should be me. So. Yeah, and, and um, to double up on what Alyssa said, I mean, not only a consensus document, but an AD sponsored document can be a BCP, can be a standard track document, whatever you want. AD sponsored is still an IETF document and therefore can be of any of those um, statuses. And uh, yes, it's a required four week last call, but there's nothing that prevents the AD from saying, we're gonna discuss this for another four weeks or another eight weeks or whatever it is. Um, and whether that happens on the last call list or a new mailing list is made, th those are all, um, I think, legitimate dispatch questions as far as what do we want? What kind, do we want a document or not? And what sort of document and what we think the appropriate venue for discussing that document is. So I, I think, thank you, Alyssa, that, that was helpful. Um, and that, it, yes. Uh, and that's all I see in the queue. And I don't mind giving you back eight minutes. Does anybody have uh, any other comments? I, I just wanted to report from the Jabber chat that wasn't summarized. Um, I saw some support for Rich ID about an IAB program. I think that. Yes, thank you. And and uh, Rich did make that comment. Um, and yeah, there were a couple of notes of support in the Jabber room. I note uh, noted that uh, Joel didn't think that was a good idea, um, and, and maybe others have, are of the same opinion. Uh, but yes, uh, definitely get that in the uh, in the minutes as well. Um, all right. Uh, and no, by the way, Alyssa, I, I think there was the impression that an AD sponsored document might not have the same statuses. And, and I think that's spot on uh, that, that they can. So, um, all right, well, that's where we are for now. So uh, the next tasks are for 
the chairs to get this all summarized and put out to the list. Uh, we'll consult with Alyssa uh, just to make sure that, uh, you know, she agrees with us on what, what we have heard. And then we will post to the list. We can have some discussion on the list, uh, especially if we've gotten something wrong from those notes. Uh, and then we will have another meeting on a, a week from yesterday. Uh, so on Monday, uh, this coming week, and you are all welcome to join again, but we will try and come up with the focus of that agenda, uh, in the next day or two so that we, uh, have something specific to talk about and we will see some of you next week. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. And Francesca, you will stop the recording, I presume. <laughs>